Hey, what's up, my C-Sharp Massive? So in the past few weeks, we've been doing a lot with showing devices. Uh, we did a review of the Lenovo Yoga 9i, which is a dual screen uh, laptop. And we recently did a walkthrough of the purchasing experience of the Tesla. In this video, we're gonna go back to looking at some Azure related things. Uh, we're gonna look at app services. And the reason that we're doing this is because if you watched our last video on the Tesla, uh, you would have seen that the Tesla actually has a browser interface that functions while the car is driving. So it's a, a vector that we can attach uh, software to to enhance the capabilities of the Tesla. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using the Tesla API to build a dashboard, a web-based dashboard um, that you can use to maybe see some statistics about your car while you're driving and some metrics on things that are actually happening uh, with your vehicle. As part of that, we're going to be starting uh, this video session with looking at some Azure services that we can use to basically enhance those capabilities. Specifically, obviously, because it's a browser, we're going to have to launch a website that's hosted inside the browser and attach it to, to that. Um, and then on the flip side of it, we're also going to be using things like Event Hub and Service Bus to basically log those messages that are coming out of your Tesla, all the telemetry that's associated with it, maybe into the Event Hub, and then ultimately surfacing that inside of some kind of analytics dashboard, crunching the numbers, and then serving it on this web page for you to be able to see what's actually happening in your vehicle. So let's go ahead and get started with building an app service and walking through all the capabilities of an Azure app service. So what you're looking at right now is the Azure dashboard. Very quickly over the top here, you have essentially uh, the location for the cloud shell, which you can use to do Azure related activities using a command prompt style interface. Uh, we have the ability to switch your directories. A directory can be thought of as an account, an Azure account. And within a directory, you can have multiple subscriptions, management groups, and other artifacts that we'll talk about uh, in future videos. You have your notifications. Many of the things that happen in Azure happen in the background, and you're notified through this notifications view, which basically shows you all the things uh, that have happened, shows you while they're happening, and shows you when they've completed. Uh, you have your settings where you can set some general information about your environment. So for example, I can go in and I can apply the light theme, which now makes uh, the screen a white and gray theme. You have your support and troubleshooting area where you can go in to help and support and reach out to Azure professionals who can help you. Uh, and then you have feedback and here you can basically provide feedback associated with the Azure Act, um, Azure services that you have. Finally, this last setting allows you to quickly switch between directories uh, on Azure and gives you a trajectory that you can use to go in and check your settings. On the left side here, you have pinned services that you want uh, to use. So if there's frequently used activities that you do, services that you create in Azure, you can pin them over here. Uh, it comes with some defaults and then some you basically add. I've actually added the static web apps uh, to this. That does not show up by default. I don't even think the Azure function shows up by default. We'll be going through all of these in subsequent videos, but for now our focus would be this app services um, node. So app services is how you can create an actual website in Azure. Basically, every app service is a website or an HTTP-based service of some kind. You can think of it as a, as a cloud-based web server that can serve your pages. Um, and those pages can be both Java or Node or Python or, of course, C Sharp uh, hosted in .NET. You can create an app service by simply clicking on the create button here and you'll see that you have several choices. You have a standard web app, you have a static web app, 
you have a web app and the database and then you have a WordPress site that's hosted on an app service these are your choice for creating them you can also create any resource by clicking on the create a resource button here uh, and then over here basically search for it so if I type a web app then you see that all your choices for web apps show up and here's a standard web app or you can type app service and again if you look down here on the app service you have uh, your web app located and you also have static web app you have an api app you have an azure function basically an app service is a technology that's used to host several services that azure offers websites are one of those azure functions is another one which is this sort of event driven service that can respond to events that happen on your service using code logic app is another which basically provides the same thing but it's a no code solution for doing this api management is another one which basically allows you to create an api bridge almost like a proxy between your app service and the external world that's accessing your app service. So let's go ahead and let's create an app service the old fashioned way. We'll go into app services and we'll click on web app. And then in here, uh, what you can do is you can pick a resource group. A resource group is basically a logical container that you can use to group various services together and manage them together. Uh, the benefit of using a resource group, you can't do anything without it, but the benefit of using a resource group to group your services together is that that's basically a grouping that you can manage from a security perspective you can give permissions to access and you could do things that will affect everything that's inside of the resource group so for example if i built a whole bunch of services and i put them into a resource group when i delete the resource group it'll delete all the underlying services associated with it so we already have a resource group created right now it's called demonstration so we'll use that the next thing here is the name for the app service. So an app service can be called anything, but because app services by default are open to the whole world, the name you provide here um, is a name that has to be unique like, like any other website name. There are not two hotmails.com or two googles.com. There's just one. So in the same way, if I call it test as an example, a search will be performed and you'll see that test is not available. That's because someone out there somewhere has an app service called test.azurewebsites.net. So the key thing to note here is that when you create an app service, it's created as a subdomain of the azurewebsites.net uh, principle or primary domain. Everything is subdomained off of that when you create an app service in, in one form or another. So ensure that your app services are unique one way to do that is to, for example, add the company that you're in or the project that you're working on as part of the name. So right now we've created an app. We've given it a name, Tesla dashboard Azure websites .net. Once we're done creating everything, that's what it's going to be called. Next, you can pick between how you want to publish your app service. So you have a choice between publishing it as code, meaning that your when you build your application and i'm going to be speaking for the perspective of this demo uh, using uh, c sharp and net when you build your application in a project and you publish it uh, to an app service that's a code-based app service basically all the html files the javascript the css all that will be copied over as well as the libraries um, that are necessary to run your application if it's a server-side application that does some server-side compute. Um, you can also choose a Docker container, in which case your entire uh, application will be, will be hosted as a container that will run as an app service. So this is a great way of publishing an app as an app service if the technology that you're using is not a technology that's natively supported by the app service runtime. There is a technology uh, of sorts that runs everything inside of these app services. Uh, and um, if that technology has not yet been updated, so for example, a few months back, .NET 8 was not available inside of app service at all, 
So you could still use .NET 8 or .NET 9 or some cool new technology and just host it inside of a container. As a matter of fact, you could build your own web server, host it in a container, and then uh, run that container inside of App Service. Uh, for the purposes of this demo, we're going to be using uh, the code. Next, you can pick your runtime stack. As mentioned, um, you have a choice between .NET, Java, Python, Node. And so if you go in here, you can see uh, all the technologies that can be used and the versions that can be used. So here's an example. Uh, you can use Python 3.8. You can use Python uh, 3.12. If there was a Python 3.15 out there, obviously it's not available here, so you wouldn't be able to use it here. So for that particular app service, you would have to use a Docker container so that it can be used. You can also use PHP, you can also use Node, you can also use Java, there's various versions, and you can use two forms of .NET. You can use the ASP.NET, which would be the .NET framework, that's the Windows-based version of .NET, or you can use uh, .NET 6, uh, 7, 8, all that, all these new versions of .NET coming out, which are all based on a technology called .NET Core. It's sort of like a runtime that can run on multiple operating systems. Uh, you can think of the new .NET, really .NET 3.1, um, 5, 6, 7, 8, as being comparable technologies to Java. They basically uh, follow the write once, run anywhere pattern. I'm going to use .NET 8 here. And because I've selected .NET 8, you now have the choice between Linux or Windows. If I went down here and say selected ASP.NET v4, you would see that the Linux is grayed out and only Windows uh, can be used. Now, one question to ask here is why would you choose one versus the other? Well, it really depends on what you want to do from a management perspective and also uh, overarching costs, right? So if you're more familiar with uh, Linux, Linux-based programming, uh, then, then maybe Linux is a better solution for you, particularly if you're doing things that involve the underlying operating system, setting environment variables, copying files, maybe invoking services or processes that you think are available on the, on the underlying platform. If you're not, then there's absolutely nothing wrong with using Windows. Um, as a as an underlying platform there are differences in costs so I would look to see what the costs are use the Azure pricing calculator to determine that but for the most part because of the way app services are set up and because they are pass based services there it should not matter which version you use it should not matter which operating system you use you should be able to just use Windows and be fine with it or just use Linux and be fine with it. It's really, it's really, it really boils down to you and what you want to do. The next thing you want to look at is the region that you want this application to be deployed to. Um, Azure has multiple data centers. You can think of the region as a data center or a location that may have multiple data centers in it. For example, there's the East, which is New York up to Boston, maybe out to Pennsylvania, and then you've got like um, East 2, which is more like uh, 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 DC and DC and down from there. It's really just where this where your code is going to be running from. This has value because depending on where your code is running from, the amount of time it takes to make a request to your servers and get a, re a response back would obviously be different if you have your website set up to run in in, um, I don't know, England or something, uh, then the performance gains that you have for customers in the U.S. or the performance profile that you see for customers in the U.S. will likely be different from customers located uh, in London. So think about how you want your application to be deployed uh, globally and use that to determine what kinds of regions that you want to put it in. Next, we have our the the basically the pricing plans. <clears throat> so, app services use something called an app service plan uh, to do the pricing on it. Now, you can think of an app service plan as the server that this is going to run on. Now, your app services are virtualized, right? So they they ultimately will run on some some hardware somewhere, but you can decide what hardware that's going to be after the fact. You can create it and then change it at any point in time. 
the value proposition of the app service plan is that it basically sets the kind of server that your app service code will be running on, right? So you're saying, you might be saying, hey, I want this thing to run on a dual core um, processor. I want this run, I want this, my app service to run on this hardcore premium machines. I want this app service to be completely isolated. I don't want it to be running in this public web. I want to use my own dedicated hardware or I want to use my own hypervisor which is the virtualization technology that this uses to run your app service. These are all options that you have. As you can see, a standard pricing plan right now um, basically uh, is a one CPU, 1.7 gig memory. That's what you're getting uh, by default when you, when you choose this. And you can, of course, change it uh, at any point in time. So I can create a new one. And when I create a new one, I can go in here now and I can select from multiple different options. The lowest option is basically the free one. With the free one, you basically get an hour per day of your app service being up and running and function, and then it dies down. So this is great for demos. All the way at the, at the highest end, you have your isolated app service where you're essentially picking, uh, you have 32 gig of RAM, um, and um, you have eight CPU cores. For our demo, we're gonna use a standard uh, one because um, that should be fine. And then down here, you have your zone redundancy. So basically, if you recall, we were talking about, um, we we're talking about the data centers and the regions that your app service uh, runs on. So Azure has these multiple regions out there and within these regions, you basically have, you may or may not have multiple data centers inside of that region. If you set up your app service with no zone redundancy, what that means is that your app service will run in one of the data centers within that region, and it will always run in that data center within that region. The problem with that approach is that if you're building a high available website, meaning you're building a website that you always want running no matter what happens, if there's an outage in that data center where your app service is running on, then when people try to access your website, they will not be able to. To mitigate that, um, what you can do is you can enable zone redundancy. When you enable zone redundancy, your app service can be deployed to multiple data centers, zones, within that particular region so that even if one of the data centers goes down, your app service and that code and your site will continue to function because a request will basically be coming to the other zone where your app service is located. Now, zone redundancy will depend on the kind of app service that you create. So if I pick a premium, you can see now that I now have the ability to enable zone redundancy, whereas for the version that I'm picking, which is standard, uh, you can see that zone redundancy is disabled. For the purposes of this demo, we're going to pick premium so we can enable zone redundancy. So now that we've set up the basic parameters of the app service, uh, these next settings basically allow you to configure various aspects of the app service that's not related to the name and basically how it's going to be structured the app service itself the first is creating a database this is not something that ever needs to be done as part of creating the app service um, but in general if you select that then you can pick uh, the database you want to use the technology you want to use you can see the various choices here you can pick the server name pick the database name this is essentially just shorthand for things that you can do yourself. If I go down to the SQL databases section, I can actually create a database there. Um, and um, obviously, if, uh, if this is a Cosmos DB, then I can also create a database. So this is just allows you to do it all in one shot. For the most part, I think it makes more sense to just do it one by one as you go along. Deployment lets you basically set up um, uh, deployment of your code onto the app services. Again, for the purposes of this demo, we're gonna we're not gonna be using Azure DevOps or GitHub. We're actually gonna be deploying directly from uh, from our machine. I do have a video that 
talks through and walks through Azure DevOps and deploying code using Azure DevOps using a DevOps pipeline. So go back and look at that video if you want some, some insights on how to do that. Networking. So what is networking? So your app service by default is always public. We talked about it before. Your app service is going to have that, whatever the name is, .azurewebsites.net. That's basically how it's going to be set up. So what you can do here is you can say, hey, I don't want public access, right? In which case, you will not be able to access this app service using that that web address and everything that's done with the app service will be internal right so for people who want to use their app services to run line of business applications inside of their network so using app services with the public access obviously will not satisfy that so for those scenarios you would disable uh, the public access, uh, in which case you'd only be able to access it internally. Now there's a way to do it. And again, I have a video where I discussed it. It's using a technology called private endpoints and private link. This will allow you to create uh, a resource inside of your network, right? That you can use to access your app service. That resource would take on a different uh, name for the app service. So instead of um, being called azurewebsites.net, it'll be called, I think, privatelink.azurewebsites.net. So you'll have a different subdomain name and that sub subdomain name will resolve to an IP address uh, that is inside of your network. And so um, callers from different resources that you have inside of your private network will be able to access your website but people from outside of your network will not be able to access it. So that's what that does there. Network injection is the other end. So one side of app services is people from the outside calling into your app service, right? People accessing your website. The other side of it is your app service accessing into your network. Again, because your app service is public, it's not private, you would not be directly able to access your internal resources that you have in your internal networks from basically the app service. In order to make you able to do that, you have to enable network injection. When you enable network injection, it's going to ask you to pick a virtual network within your, within your cloud network that this app service will have access to. Now, once it's sort of like injected that way, as long as your app service has access to that subnet, anything that subnet has access to inside of your network, um, you'll be able to access naturally uh, using your app service. So for people who are connecting, let's say, their Azure app service to a database inside of your network, you can uh, use this capability to do that. One thing to keep in mind is that um, when you do this, when you set up um, network integration in this manner, network injection, uh, that subnet is isolated, right? Nothing else can live inside of that subnet. So it needs to be an empty subnet that's going to be used for this brokering of messages from your app service into your internal network. For what we're doing, we're not going to need that. And for what we're doing, we're obviously going to be accessing it from the outside world because we're accessing it from from our Tesla. Uh, so we're going to turn on public access and we're going to disable network injection. Now, on the monitoring side, it's very important that your app services that you create are monitored in some way that you can see what's happening, see the network traffic, um, because you're not going to be able to directly connect to a computer and start running the th sorts of things that you're used to run running when you basically put an put a website on a VM. For example, let's say you're a Windows developer and you have um, your Windows server and you have um, IIS, which stands for Internet Information Server running. And so you can basically just deploy your code onto your web server. And once you have it on your web server, you can sign in using RDP or remote desktop technology of your choice. And then once you're on that machine, you can turn on whatever kind of logging, whether it be performance counters or the event log or what have you to basically monitor what's going on 
on that specific machine. You won't be able to do that with this. So it is important that you enable App Insights because App Insights gives you that same, basically it surfaces that same information so that you can use a dashboard, a web-based dashboard to basically view everything and ensure that everything is running as normal. And I have a video on monitoring again, which shows you how to do alerts, how to uh, send emails out from it and how to react to things that are happening on your app service and how to build elasticity by basically scaling up or scaling down based on how much traffic you're, you're hitting or is hitting your website or based on how much uh, the CPU is being used um, and various metrics that you can use to basically alert yourself and automatically make changes to the app service to allow your app to continue to run. So you do all that here. I'm just going to allow it to create a new one in the same region and leave it at that. Finally, uh, you can add tags to your app service. Tags basically allow you to easily find your app service and classify your app service in multiple ways. Everyone knows what tags are. So if you're familiar with tagging and any number of things, basically adding metadata and doing some t adding attributes to your uh, to any resource so that you can search for that thing at a later date. This is what that is. Uh, nothing new here. Once you have all this set up, it's going to go through and make sure that what you've created makes sense. Um, as you can see, my premium plan is uh, going to cost me almost uh, $230, basically $230 a month. Uh, um, it's Even though it shows that price, you're not going to be charged $230 a month. So, for example, once I'm done with this demo, I'm going to actually delete all this stuff and delete the resource group. And all this stuff is going to go away. So I'm only going to pay for the period of time when this is is running so you basically pay per hour i think for for app services so let's go ahead and let's create it okay so it looks like this has been created and once everything is created you can click on go to resource and it'll take you directly to the resource you can also go over here to this app services tab um, and when you click on it you should now see your resource it says their tesla dashboard so if i click in there um, that brings me in here and as you can see here is the domain name that's been created tesla dashboard.azurewebsites.net so i can click on that and that just takes me to the website so this is the actual website um, that's created. It's running right now and it's ready to go. There's nothing in it but this uh, this home page right now. So we're, we can start to deploy things to it. So before we do our deployment, let's take a look at some of the things that are on this dashboard that's associated with the app service. As you can see, the essentials, this just gives you basic information about your app service, it, whether it's running or not, The basically the subscription that it's a part of, the subscription ID. Um, you can see the, the default domain that's been created. Here's a subdomain. We can change that. Here's the app service plan that we have. Here's the operating system and you can configure health checks. Under properties, uh, we can see that the publishing model is code. We're using .NET 8. Again, we can see domains. We can create a custom domain and we'll show that uh, how to create that in a little bit. Um, you can see that the plan type is an app service plan. That's the name. It's Windows. It comes with three instances, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And then you can scale up and scale down your instances, which means create more and more. You can think of instances as basically servers, right? So when you create an app service, you're not necessarily creating it in just one machine. You're basically creating back in the days what would be called a Windows cluster with Windows or a cluster of servers where you have some type of load balancer in front and then you have a bunch of servers behind that handle the load so they can be distributed across um, all those servers. Okay. Uh, you can see all your deployment, you can see your dashboard, and you can see your networking where you have your virtual public IP address. Now, if I take this public IP address and I actually try to put that in here, it's not going to go anywhere. Why is it not going anywhere? Uh, because even though you have that public IP address, multiple people 
out there in the world can also have that same IP address. The way that the service makes a distinction between you and anybody else is by this host name that's up here. So when I make a request for the server using this host name, it will still resolve to that IP address. And you can see here, I've now requested Tesla dashboard Azure websites net um, using the NS lookup and the IP address that's returned is 20.119.8.54. Um, and you can see here that the virtual IP is 20.119.8.54. So anytime it gets that address, it's going to resolve to that IP address. Anytime it gets that host name, sorry, it actually resolves to that IP address. Now the outbound IP address, these are the IP addresses that will be used when you're making calls out to somewhere else. So for example, if from my app service, I make a web call, a, a restful call to, um, to your app service or somebody else's app service, and let's say your app service has some kind of firewall that's blocking uh, just anybody calling them, I would have to give you these IP addresses to say, hey, um, put whitelist all these IP addresses so that I'm able to access you, right? So that's why this information is important. Next, we look at the activity log. Basically, the activity log um, talks about who's touched this app service, what they've done with it, who's touched it from a dashboard perspective. This is not the website itself. This is the management of the website. This allows you to run reports to find out if people have made changes to it, created things, modified things, whatever. Any change you make to the app service will show up here. The access control. This is how you can specify who can again access this app service from the perspective of managing it. If someone does not have um, contributor permissions to, uh, to this particular resource, then they will not be able to make any changes to the resource. Here's where the resource group comes in handy because for example, if I go up to my resource group and I click on the demonstrations resource group and I go to access control, you see that there's also access control associated with it at that level. So anything inside of that resource group, if you do not, if I do not give you access to, to make changes and be a creator within the resource group, then anything inside of that resource group, you will not be able to modify and may not even be able to see. Right. And I can even make it so that you can't even see that resource and only people who have the proper permissions will be able to see it. So it's a very powerful uh, utility. So we'll go back in here, go back into this guy and then tags. This just once again shows all the tags that we have. I haven't added any tags to it at this point in time. Um, you have your your ability to diagnose issues and resolve them. That's This is your center to basically check to see if something is going on. Um, you have your Windows Defender for Cloud. This basically adds additional security, enhanced security to basically this service. Uh, so I would, I would recommend that you go and look into all the capabilities that that, that provides. For you to use this, I, th I believe you have to have a certain, uh, your subscription has to be at a certain level. Um, now these are, this is always changing, so it really depends on, on what, what plan you have, what relationship you have with Microsoft in terms of like how much you're paying them and the services that they're providing to you can affect what all shows up here. But in general, it's a place where you can see if there are security issues associated with your site or things that you can do to basically make changes to your site to make it more secure. This comes in handy, especially if you have a public site because you may face things like denial of service or whatnot. So uh, this helps you um, basically track those things. The event section gives you the ability to, as it says here, build reactive automated applications. These are again, not tied to 
the um, not tied to what a user is doing, but more tied to the activities that are happening with your specific uh, app service. You can use it to track when various things happen to your app service from a management perspective and either log those things or make changes based on uh, those things happening. As an example, I can go out here and I can, for example, create a new event grid called Tesla demo and Tesla demo. And then if I go here under the filter events and I click on that, you can see that these are the, some of the things that will trigger an event, right? So when this event happens, it can fire off something that hits an Azure function or fire off something that hits a logic app. Two things I will talk about, they are kinds of app services. They're essentially either a code driven or a no code driven way of, of um, adding some type of interactivity uh, to your overall infrastructure. Not any given application, but your infrastructure architecture. So here are things that you can check whether the app is updated, meaning new code is added. So when new code is added, you want to do something, whether a slot is basically swapped, started, all different things. And it's great. Um, this tool is great to get notifications, but also to do additional logging uh, that may not be naturally available to you. Here are some of the choices you have. So as mentioned, you have Logic App as a place where the events will, be, will trigger some behavior. Again, you have Azure Functions. So when something happens, you trigger a behavior. You have Webhook, which is just you send. When something happens, you basically send um, a RESTful HTTP message out to somewhere in the web for something to do something with this information. You can dump it into a queue, and then you can listen for messages from that queue. You can dump it to an event hub, which is a, uh, a, a highly performant queue, real-time queue, you could say. And again, we listen for messages as those come in. You could put it into a service bus queue, a service bus topic, uh, and any number of things. Next, we go into deployment, right? So an app service can be set up to have multiple slots. Now, each slot that is that your app service has is another app service that you're paying for, right? This is not some free thing. What is a slot? A slot is essentially a clone of your app service that is exists there for you to do deployments to. People can access that if you give them access to that URL. And then the idea is that, for example, back in the day, you would maybe have two servers, one is production, one is maybe just um, maybe just dark prod, meaning it's production. It's got production code on it, but it's not publicly available. Whenever there's an upgrade that happens to your site, you never deploy directly to production because you don't want any downtime. What you do is you deploy to this dark prod, this other version of production. You do all your tests there, and once you're sure that this environment is functioning and has everything it's supposed to have and is fully working, you basically go to your load balancer or your your host DNS um, uh, entry, whoever is hosting your DNS entries, and you switch it so that the all your traffic is not going to that dark prod, right? And then basically the other one becomes orphaned, right? So the former dark prod becomes your main prod. Your current main prod now becomes your dark prod. One way that's, that, that used to be done in the past is that each of those servers might have two different IP addresses. So all you have to do is go into your DNS or your, whoever your, your, your hosting uh, vendor is and just switch the IP address. So instead of going to 10.0.0.1, now it's going to 10.0.0.2. That's what your URL, when they put in Tesla dashboard .azure -websites net that's where it's going to go and then everything else nothing goes there now now you can make your changes there for the next time you're releasing and the next time you're releasing now you swap back that same capability is built into app services so i can add another slot here which would cost me another 230 dollars and then i can deploy to that slot and then basically uh, when i want to publish it 
I publish the I, I swap slots and then the other slot becomes uh, becomes the main production and this one is no longer production right and when we go and we do our deployment you will see this so let's go ahead and let's quickly create a slot so we'll call it Tesla we'll just call it Tesla dashboard 2 so we add it as a slot So now we've created two slots, and as you can see here, one is production, one is not production. And I can go in here and I can make this 50%. And when I make it 50%, what it's gonna do is it's gonna say, hey, some of my traffic is gonna go to this guy, some of my traffic is gonna go to this guy. You can set it however you want. So again, the reason why you have that traffic percentage is that when you launch something and launch it to production before you swap slots, you might still want some people to use it for a while. Um, some people will get directed to that new site. Some people will get the old site. So with the traffic, you're able to basically decide one way or the, the other who you want to use, right? How much traffic you want directed to, uh, to this sort of dark prod. And whenever you're ready, you can basically click on swap and that's going to swap everything up. So now we've swapped it up and so this guy now has what was previously production and the old production is now in here. So we go here and refresh it. You should see that nothing has basically changed. Nothing has changed because they both basically have the default uh, code. Uh, we've not deployed anything in here. So because of that, obviously nothing has changed. So let's go to the deployment center. So in the deployment center, you can basically specify um, how, the manner in which uh, you want uh, things uh, deployed. So you can see here that I can switch it from, you know, use use GitHub, use Big Bucket, use Local Kit, use Azure Local Git, use um, Azure um, Azure repos or what have you. You have any number of ways to do that. Um, it also provides you your FTP so that you can actually go and you know FTP and publish your code using FTP. And so if you just want, let's say this is supposed to be just a static site just a marketing site, then you can just FTP in, no need to use code, no need to use Visual Studio or anything like that. Just cop, just literally copy your code over and you're all set. So this is um, obviously a way of doing that. So the next thing is your configuration. So here's where you can do a couple of things. You can configure your app settings. Your app settings are not hosted in a flat file that's part of your uh, your app service package that gets deployed, your code package, they're actually hosted um, uh, using this service, which is a great configuration service, actually. It basically allows you to host your app settings, which will be applied across all the app services that you have as part of this, this overarching app service. Again, remember, the slots themselves are app services that you're paying for. It's very important to note that because you will get sticker shock if you don't understand that. So in here, you can have your settings for, for database, your settings for, you know, for, for pretty much anything. Uh, you know, like if you have any actual manual settings that you want applied to your site, you can just put them here and you're all set. You also have your general settings here where you can, you can make changes to your app service, right? So in here, um, I don't know why that's set as that, but we'll switch it over. So switch it over to .NET 8. And as you can see here, 32-bit platform integrated. You can also have it be the classic mode. You can set up whether you want to HTTP 1.0, 2.0. Um, a lot of different things. You can set cores here, session affinity. This is if you want to have sticky sessions or not sticky sessions. These are all web-based things um, that if you're building a large-scale website, you should understand. 
So when, when session affinity um, is on, then basically if you are navigated to one slot, then you're gonna keep navigated to that slot for that session. If it's off, you should have a stateless application, meaning that um, every request that the customer makes uh, to your site doesn't matter. You're just, you know, it's it's gonna treat it like a brand new request every single time, in which case you should turn that off because then it doesn't have to maintain state between requests. You can enable whether you want HTTPS only. That is the default with Azure. Um, if you have this off, it won't do redirecting. If you have it on, then it'll actually do an HTTP redirect for you. There's a bunch of things here, certificates and whatnot that you can set. Uh, the default documents, you can set what the default documents for your applications are. So that is that when you go to, if I go to, you notice here I haven't specified a, a document. I've just left it as this. Uh, when I do that, it's going to pick one of these things. I don't know what it actually has. Let me try default.ac. Right. So there, there is some <laughs> something that it has. Maybe it's hosting start. There we go. There we go. So the HTML we're looking at right now, the page we're looking at is just a static HTML. And this is actually the name of that page. Uh, and because that page is specified as, um, as basically one of the default documents, if I don't include this in here, then it'll search through those default documents. And if it finds a document that follows the that follows the naming convention, the naming standard that's specified, it will use uh, that document. Many of these things here have basically been, they've been built into the, the, um, the platform technologies that are used to deploy the code. So it's much better to just have these things in your code and build the appropriate handlers for various paths in your code than to hard code them into the actual hosting model of your application. Um, so that would be uh, the recommendation there. Now, another thing you can do here is that you can add additional storage, basically mount it, and then you'll be able to serve that storage, or you'll be able to access that storage uh, through your code. And then finally, you can specify your error pages. We saw an error page already, right, when we went, like if I go to test now, Right, so that's an error page that's being displayed. So I think four or three is not found. So I can pick a custom page that I wanna use as opposed to using this page. Um, and so maybe if you want something more beautiful or something that's branded to your, um, to your organization or to the application that you're building, uh, then you can just upload a page here and then that page will be used for this kind of request. And then obviously the server errors as well. You can pick a page to handle those. So we go over authentic to authentication and this allows you to add authentication to your application. You can use Facebook, you can use uh, Apple. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them. We're not going to be adding it here, but for example, if I want to pick my identity provider, I can pick from all these. I can say, Hey, I want to use the um, Apple ID or whatever. That's what I want to use or I use Microsoft, then, um, then here are some indicators for it. So you have some ability to basically um, manage your authentication. Maybe in another video, we'll go into the details on that, uh, but it's beyond the scope of this discussion. App Insights, uh, basically, remember we, in, we, we added App Insights uh, to the app service, but it's not enabled, so we can actually enable it here. Once it's enabled, you have access to your App Insights. It's now started logging. So as you can see, we can go into a dashboard and we can start seeing failed requests, uh, server response time, server request availability. So it gives you a bunch of information that you're, that you're basically blind to. Um, if you don't have this enabled or you'd have to find a way to track it, you really won't have a way to track things like your response time. I suppose you can do it through your application, um, but you will really won't have that. On top of that, I can use this instrument, instrumentation key and within the code of my application, I can actually write to this. So you not only can be storing 
um, the general uh, environment related um, performance data and um, server health data, but you can also add code specific uh, metrics here and track code specific things uh, through this uh, through through this so your app service is going to be potentially accessing um, other resources that are in Azure for example it could be accessing a database uh, to get information to serve uh, you know to serve your your capabilities so in here you can decide whether or not you want to use this the system assigned managed identity or you want to create your own managed identities and then you want to pick and choose what you want to give those identities uh, access to. It's really up to you. Um, but basically, this is the identity that your application is going to be running as, as it's going through and doing things. Back in the day when we used, um, when these were all Windows servers on the Windows side, um, you could think of it as a as a service account, right? The account that you create in Active Directory, um, that would be the account that the that your website runs under, and then you can that service account you may then give permissions in your database and say, hey, this service account is a DBA in this database, and so when you make your request from your website to the database, you don't need to ha to have the connection string with the um, Username and password hard coded in there. You could just um, say, "Hey, use the integrated identity." In which case, it would take whatever identity the uh, the website is using when it's making a call to the database, and that's the identity that I would use to I, to authenticate against the database. So this is essentially the same thing just happening at cloud scale. Backups are self-explanatory. It's just taking a backup of your site, and now we get to the cool stuff so custom domains so let's say you don't like the domain that's been created uh, for you and if, if we're building a production site you're not going to want to use something called azurewebsites.net then you can actually create your own custom domains right you can even buy those domains and you can even apply certificates to them now this is a, a pretty robust topic that we can tackle in a separate video for now suffice it to say that you are able to uh, to customize the domains that your app service uh, works with it certificates work essentially the same way they work in combination or in tandem with custom domains to give you a secure environment when you add a custom domain because azure uses https you will need to add a certificate associated with that custom domain to just keep everything kosher so that customers don't start getting the error messages when they try to access uh, your site that tells them hey this site is not secure or what have you so it's important to add your certificates there the good thing with this is that you can essentially do everything internal to azure you don't need to to leave azure to create these certificates you can buy them here and they'll be renewed uh, through Azure, I don't think they automatically renew. You might have to basically go in and and renew them uh, when they run out, um, or if they automatically renew at this point, then then you have that option. But essentially, these are just the certificates that your application will run under, so that you can use an HTTPS uh, um, based request, so that you can handle HTTPS based requests. Networking, we already talked about as we were creating uh, the app service. Basically, this just allows you to create private inbound connections to your app service and also allows you to connect to resources that are inside of your virtual networks that are hosted inside of your Azure infrastructure. It's pretty much that simple. So scale up and scale out, what are these things, right? So scale up basically is vertical scaling which means just right now we're set up as premium so i can go up all the way to you know various levels of premium or i can even go down at this point to the free version scale out is the opposite as you can see here this app service has been set out to run on three instances that means three servers what that really means is that it could potentially be four servers because remember you have one server that's serving as your your slot right so depending on what version you have you may be able to reduce this to zero or there may be a limit to how many instances you can have and as you can see here 
you can decide whether or not you want to do this rule based in which case it will use information from your monitoring to determine whether to scale up or scale down and it looks like they now have an automatic version that can do some cool stuff in an automated fashion and as mentioned when you make something zone redundant that means that you have a copy um, in in another zone at least and with app services you actually have a copy in each of the zones right and with any single region you will have three data centers within that region so you'll have three zones within that region that to choose from when you set this up as zone redundant basically it's gonna put a copy of your app service and replicate a copy of your app service across the three zones and those are the three instances that you're seeing here so the next thing is um, web jobs. Web jobs are basically uh, this technology uh, that hosts background processes um, on app services. So you can think of it as a long running, you know, console application that's basically running inside of an app service that's doing this, that, um, or the other thing. So if you if you have a background process, if you have scripts or things like that. Um, then web jobs are a great way of uh, leveraging that. So they're pretty cool technology, but they've been supplanted by more modern uh, things out there uh, like Azure Functions, uh, which you can set up with cron to run uh, using, a, uh, using a cron timer. So you can set up to run at intervals and do some work and then, and then you know, fall out once it's done. Or as mentioned, if you want to reduce your code footprint then you can use logic app which is a no code solution for doing some of these things service connectors basically provide you an easy to use way to connect to back-end services so this would be something like your database postgres db um, cosmos db that sort of thing uh, a lot of what you do here you can do in code and i'm more accustomed to doing in code um, just because you have, again, the freedom of your code basically controlling uh, everything as opposed to setting up this app service that has to be configured in a very specific way for it to function. Your properties basically give you some of the information you already have, the FTP site, um, the URLs located, located in the pub virtual IP and the outbound IPs that you use. So this is just a quick way to get information about your app service, um, particularly if you need uh, to share that information for aforementioned reasons, like if you need to share all your outbound IP so that they can be whitelisted uh, by an end user. Locks can be used to control certain Azure resources so that they can't be modified. Again, remember that Azure is an overarching platform where people are accessing it from the command line, people are accessing it using automation tools and things of that nature, uh, people are accessing it uh, from the portal, and people are doing some stuff using BICEP and other technologies that can be used to deploy things and modify whole environments. So when you set a lock on a resource, basically you can prevent people from being able to make changes to that resource. So when they try to do things like have a script out there that deletes a resource group and then recreates everything for whatever reason if you don't want that to happen then you can prevent it using locks app service plans we've already seen uh, how they function basically as you can see uh, we're now looking at the resource itself and not the app service or you can think of it as we're looking at the not the bare metal but you can think of it like the the pc or the cluster that's running it and of course, when you go in the app service plan and the app service plan view, you can actually go and see what all the resources are sitting inside of the app service plan. You have the ability to change your app service plan, right? So in here, uh, I could create a new one and basically take the app service and shift it uh, to a new app service plan. And that can all be done here. And of course, once you're done, you can delete the old one. So for example, if you start out with two app services in the same plan or multiple app services in the same plan then over time you can start migrating those app services into their own plans um, if for whatever reason you you they don't have the same criteria and characteristics by which you basically manage them and by which you um, you scale them so if you have a high performance aspect 
if you have a high performance application that's basically sitting in the same app same app service plan as a medium or low performant one then you might want to create a new app service plan for it once you have all your code written and everything working and basically just migrate it over there um, so that everything is hosted in an environment that you can properly control and manage from a scale perspective now we go into the development tools. And so these are the things that you can use to manage your app service, uh, you know, from a code perspective uh, and, you know, make changes as you see fit. And you really have um, a few things, but one of the coolest things that's available to you right now, and I'm gonna just go straight to it, um, is this app service editor. So what this app service editor allows you to do, it actually allows you to, as the name implies, edit your app service and when this opens you'll see that you have all the code uh, for your app service here's the hosting start right and I can just for example delete all that and I can create my own code And that's automatically saved. So if I now go here and I refresh this, you can see it says, hello, Tesla, right? So that's just the code that I literally just copied in here and set up. But now what happens if we go back to our slots and we swap slots again? So we've now swapped slots and now when we go back here and refresh that you can see that it's now showing the old uh, website right so it's so again two different app services they call them slots but you can switch one versus the other right so on one code I've made some modifications and it says hello Tesla on the other it still says um, uh, the old stuff And if I swap back, you should see that that basically um, the old stuff is gone and the new stuff is now what's showing. Okay, so we swap the slots again. And if I go back here and I refresh this guy, you see it goes back to the Hello Tesla. So this is a cool new way um, for you to be able to edit uh, what you what you have there. As yet, it does not really provide you a way to add files to it, but the files that you, you do have there, you can go in and modify uh, as you see fit. Now, when you do need to make some, some changes to it, uh, then you can use the advanced tools section, right? Which will take you into Kudu And from here, as you can see, I can actually add a new file, right? So I can basically click on add new file. Now it's not gonna upload a file, um, but let's say I call it test123.html. Actually, I'm gonna add it inside of dub dub root. Right, then if I go here, You can see that the file is actually being served. And of course, I can go back to the app service editor. And the file is located here. And just gonna add it here and say, Once that's saved, and if I refresh that, this is the test file. 
So you can use both of these to quickly create, um, you know, files and add content to those files. And between the two of these, you sort of have a, <laughs> you know, a little bit of a, uh, of an editor. And of course, from here, if I click on here, I can actually see that, um, I can open up Kudu directly from here and start making, you know, basically adding new files as needed. What I'd love is for them to actually add the ability to add new files from here, but uh, they don't have it right now. Of course, you can see here that it's preview. I'm sure at some point that will come. Now the console gives you another view. You already have that in Kudu. Now remember that this is Windows and we talked about this before. Because it's Windows, everything I'm doing here would all be Windows based commands, right? So I can do a DIR and I see my test and whatever. I can, you know, make a directory, right? And if I do a DIR, you see that another is a new directory there. I can create a file and whatnot. Pretty much whatever you can do from the command line, you can do from here. This console is not PowerShell. This console is a regular command line. If you want a PowerShell console, you've got to come here, right? If I do DIR here or LS here, I can see everything. The cool thing about this is that above it, you actually have an interface that you can use to do this in a more traditional sense. So you have both of them together. You have both the console and you also have the interface here. Now you also have access to extensions and here are all the extensions that you have. Uh, these are extensions to your app service that can add various kinds of capabilities to them. Uh, the next section is all API related things. Um, so you can set up an API management API <laughs> endpoint uh, and, uh, and add it uh, to your app service. API management is another kind of app service uh, that exists in Azure. It's actually a resource that you can create, configure, and pay for. Um, this provides you a mechanism to apply an API management endpoint uh, to your app service. You can specify your API definitions and you can enable cores. Cores basically allows for um, cross site access. So if you have a site that's a service based site, then um, websites that call this service based site would have to be allowed. Right. So you'd have to within this site say, hey, I'm allowing all calls from this uh, this domain to be able to access the site or this IP address to be able to access the site. That's basically um, what's specified here. You can go through and configure all the callers that this site allows. Then monitoring, we sort of talked about. You can set up alerts and you can set up rules and those rules can be used to do uh, your auto elastic scaling. Um, you can look at metrics associated with your, your site. Um, so working set, CPU time, data in, data out, how many HTTP um, 101, 400 requests you get, pretty much all this stuff you can set up metrics for and set up a dashboard and use that to gauge the performance of your site. Uh, logs allows you to send uh, pretty much whatever you have, all your logging to uh, log analytics workspace that you can use to do further tracking, deeper tracking um, um, of your website. You can set up health checks. I didn't look at advisory recommendations because it's you know it's not really a service, um, but um, you can look at health checks. So if you enable health checks, uh, then basically you can specify a path in your application when the application is fully built that calls will be made into to ensure that basically uh, the app is working. Okay. Use the diagnostic settings uh, to basically administer um, exporting of stream data uh, associated with your app like HTTP logs, access audits, things of that nature. It's pretty much all listed here. Um, so this allows you to manage that. App service logs basically allow you to additional logging on your application um, and then you can specify where you want those logs sent to so for example i can specify that i want my logs sent to a container 
um, in blob storage and I can specify the retention period that I want that there. I can also specify the level of, level of things that I want to log. Do I want to log errors, warnings, information? Do I want it to be very verbose? I, you know, a lot of different options that you have here. With log streaming, as you can see, um, basically as events happen uh, in your app service, you can basically log them here. So for example, if you did some kind of uh, debug that write your, you know, if you had some kind of logging in your application and you wrote something to the log, it would be streamed and show up here. You can set it at the application level or you can look at web server log. So this is, you know, this is all available to you. On the automation section, tasks basically give you a way to manage and create recurring tasks associated with uh, the resource that you're currently in. Now, bear in mind, even though this is across, uh, it should be ultimately across all versions, all resources in Azure, it's currently only supported by certain resources and the templates that you can use that you can actually create uh, are pretty limited, but they but they can grow. Now, this is a much more lightweight version of what you typically get with Azure Automation. But in general, for example, for a web app, if I created a new task, my choice would be to basically send monthly costs for this resource to an email address uh, somewhere. If you want to do some more complex um, manipulation uh, based on a given task. Uh, then you'd have to use Azure Automation and basically hook into the various um, APIs and PowerShell capabilities that Azure provides for pulling information about resources uh, and then, you know, connecting to other services available in Azure to send the appropriate email or, or do with it as you will. And export template basically allows you after you've created your resource to convert it into an ARM template. It'll actually generate an ARM template based on the configuration that you've provided. And then you can download it and use it as part of your automation scripts to basically build an overall DevOps CI CD pipeline. So as you can see here, this entire, everything that we've done here has essentially been converted into an ARM template and move this guy up here, make it easy for you to see. Everything we've done over here has been converted into an ARM template and I can then just copy this thing and paste it somewhere else or add it to a library or, you know, or deploy it um, by basically clicking that button. It's really up to you. So if you're doing anything with, um, with DevOps and you're building your Azure environment in a production ready real scenario, not just one person uh, building it out, uh, then, um, uh, then you would likely, a good strategy is to go in here, configure it into the portal. Once you have everything configured, download the template and then use that template to build out your um, infrastructure as code scripts that would then get deployed using some deployment technology. Uh, that allows for uh, ARM templates to be used. So we've created our app service. Now let's go into Visual Studio um, and let's actually deploy uh, something into this app service. So we've looked at deploying uh, it by going into the code and actually manipulating the code directly on the app service. We also have the ability to go and create this from a code perspective. So I'm going to call it the same thing, basically dash Tesla dashboard. And I'm going to be using uh, the Blazor uh, web app, which is a new template that Blazor supports. No authentication. I'm not going to use HTTPS. Um, I'll keep the sample pages and keep it as um, don't use top level statements. And that has been created in my other window. So I'm just pulling it in here and I'm going to run one quick build. And then let's run it locally first before we start deploying it. Okay, 
So we have our basic web app. Uh, this is a Blazor app and this is a server rendered app. So everything that's happening here is happening on the server side. I can click the counters, I can go home, pretty much do all that stuff. So now that we have that, deploying it is pretty straightforward from Visual Studio. You basically click on publish and select Azure, of course. And I'm going to be using an Azure app service as a Windows based app service. So that's authenticated. And once it's authenticated to Azure, you should see here that I, you can see my demonstration resource group, which shows up as a folder here and I can click in here and here's the Tesla dashboard. Now what happens when I click in there, you see how it says deployment slots. And over here, I have Tesla Dashboard and Tesla Dashboard 2. I'm not going to publish it into Tesla Dashboard. I'll actually publish it into Tesla Dashboard 2. I'm going to deploy it as a zip. Actually, now I'll deploy it regular. Doesn't matter. So I finish here. So that set up the parameters for deployment, and I just click Publish to deploy it. And that is now deployed to Tesla dashboard two, whereas my regular Tesla dashboard still has the hello Tesla message, right? So we can see that there's two different things. And so in order to get it working, let's assume that this is production and this is our test environment. We make sure everything is working fine. And now we're ready to actually make it production. Uh, we go back to our deployment slots like we did before and we simply click on swap. Perfect, so now that has been deployed. So if I now go to my Azure, uh, to my normal Tesla dashboard, I now see that I have my counter. And what happens if I go to uh, my dark site, if I refresh it? Look at that, it now has a Hello Tesla because once again, I swapped what's in production, swapped it around, and what's running here is now the old thing that was running in production. So this has been a quick overview of using app services. As you saw here, we're able to create an app service. Uh, we were able to go through and show you all the capabilities that are available to you for an app service. And finally, we actually created a Blazor uh, web app project and we deployed that project onto the app service. Additionally, we also showed you how you can very quickly and easily manipulate an app service by going into the app service editor and actually modifying the code directly on that resource and not even having to bother with deploying code. We also showed you how to set up logging, monitoring, and we showed you how to use the automation tools to basically uh, perform recurring tasks associated with your app service. And um, finally, we showed you how to, um, to do auto scaling, how to quickly scale up, scale down, and obviously horizontally scale as the load on your site um, grows and increases. In future videos, we're gonna add more capabilities to our Tesla dashboard. Uh, we're actually also going to look on the Tesla side and ensure that that's actually displaying um, on the Tesla side. If you enjoy this video, please like, share, subscribe, and as always, happy coding and have a blessed day.